My name is Marina Corey, and I'm, uh, as I like to tell people, the new Mike. It's been seven years. I moved up here seven years ago from my Miami office, so it's been a while. But um, I actually was living in Bethesda and was one of those people who, once we had a child, moved up here. And I have to say I'm actually quite delighted because it, it's really gratifying to see Kentlands function exactly as it was designed. And it's... Um, for our daughter, it's wonderful because we take her to, you know, every park. We park our car on the weekends. We never get into it. So everything that you've heard, it's really nice to see us. I'm practicing what we preach, but it's also very nice to see, to see the sense of community that exists um, here. Now, I've also lived in cities my entire life, and Kentlands is the, the less urban place or the least urban place I've ever lived in. And I like to say it's as good as suburbia gets. Um, and I mean that in the best possible way, but it has room for improvement. And I think today's panel will um, will engage us in that debate a little bit. And, I, and I, the, what the kids said today, well, the young adults, um, resonate a little bit because the in our office we're five people here, and um, the the one who was in his 20s was the only one who said, I can't live here, it's too boring. Uh, but the 30-year-olds who have kids and myself and everybody else, we all live here and we absolutely all love it. So trying to find a place in Kentlands for those 20 and early 30 year olds is, is our challenge. And I think we're going to hear today about, and I think the densification of downtown is certainly uh, would be a step in the right direction. Um, now, Liz mentioned that we um, would, our office happens to be doing work in the Middle East. We are, but we bring our clients here and we show them, we walk them around Kenan to show them what's possible. But we also do work locally. And just last week, we were doing a project up in Frederick when, where the only directive of the developer to us was, was I want a better Kentlands. So we'll see. That's a bit of a challenge. So um, one other thing I've been thinking about today is that something Andres has, I've heard him say a thousand times, and it actually resonates uh, well at least for, for me today. He used, to, he used to say, or he likes to say, if you, in, in planning, if you lose a farm at the expense, and you get a subdivision, well, that's a downward trade. But if you're, you plan a farm and you get a community out of it, well, that's an upward trade. And I think we would all agree that for Kentland, it's certainly been an upward trade. So um, I'm delighted to be introducing these three uh, panelists. I've worked with most of the, uh, two of them and one of them parenthetically. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce them very briefly, just a one quick sentence about each of them. And I ask them to give me a little bit of a fun fact, too, which I'll weave into this. And then um, you'll see, I don't want to speak for much longer because they all have very intriguing presentations. But Bob Gibbs is a leading urban retail planning consultant. We work with him a lot. He's a charter member of the CNU and recently honored by the Clinton Presidential Library for his life's contributions to urban planning. He's also, he's also authored the principles of urban retail planning. And I think, I, I, I remember the first time I heard him speak, uh, my jaw just dropped when he was giving us these, everything about retailing and I kept thinking, are we really that predictable? Is it that, is it, do we he, he's got statistics about retailing that are actually very uh, interesting. The, our next speaker will be Colin Green. And for those of you who are on the tour with him today, um, I was actually very impressed with your knowledge, your rem what you remember of, of, of Kentlands. There's more I forget. Yeah. <laughs> but he began his town planning career in Kentlands Town Architect's office in 93, while living over Dick Arkin's garage in Old Farm. Later, he and his wife Marilyn designed and built their little house and apartment on Shefeli Square Road in 1997. He's now director of the regional planning office for HOK. And he worked on the plans for the Kentlands downtown. Uh, and I forgot, so when not planning, Colin is also the lead singer and rhythm guitarist for the rock band Curb Alert. But he has no plans to give up his day job just yet. I forgot to, uh, to mention Bob's, and I think this one's relevant. Um, he says, Jeff Campbell, whom you all heard speak earlier, taught Bob a valuable lesson in, for retail consulting. He would constantly cut his recommended retail amounts in half, even though Kenlon's market research indicated a very strong demand. 
So no matter what the demand model forecast, Jeff, Jeff would always cut that figure in half to be extra conservative. So maybe now that now it's room to rethink that. And last but not least, John Tory, as president of Tory Gallus and Partners, he's provided the strong conceptual leadership to bring his firm to national recognition. I, I'm still waiting for the perfect job where both our firms can collaborate. Thank you. <laughs> he and his creative partners have built a firm that understands the inextricable, inextricable ties between urban design and architecture and between great cities and great buildings and between conceptual thinking and creating value. And John's firm had the pleasure of designing Diane Storney's house and the first live work townhouses in Kentland and the tower houses near the old farm neighborhood. And for those of you who are not taught today, we pointed those out. And um, I wish Andres had been here, but he also considers both Jeff and Andres friends. <laughs> so um, on that note, I'm going to begin by introducing, uh, well, having uh, Bob come up and then Colin and then uh, we'll wrap it up with John. Thank you. Thank you for staying. I've been asked to talk more about the future of retail rather than about the Kentlands although I've got a lot of stories I'd like to talk about uh, about my experience here it uh, which one this one this one this one it uh, was a great honor to work in the Kent do you need both of them yeah, all right. this one's falling down Uh, it has been a great honor to work at the Kentlands and to do a lot of work with DPZ. D I'm, I'm one of the many that Andreas Dewani and Liz helped launch their career. I, I met Andreas because I was his driver when he came to give a speech in Detroit. <laughs> and uh, the next day he called me and said, I've got a new project in Providence, Rhode Island, and I told them about you and they said uh, they'll only hire him if, they brought, if, I bring, if he brings me along to be on the team. So I've had a 25-year run working with Andreas, and he really made my career, him and Liz both. Uh, the future retail is this. Future retail is, is coming back to American cities. This 1920s postcard for Detroit describes Detroit as a shopping center. And up until the 1960s, city centers were where you went shopping. They sold all of the goods and services that we needed and desired. This is downtown Houston, Texas. And you can see the J.C. Penney's and to the right, Sears and Roebuck. And downtowns included major department stores and the whole gamut of national retailers and local and regional stores. And you could buy everything from a mattress to a car to a whole bag of groceries in a downtown. This is the famous Wanamaker department store. It's about two million square feet, and uh, which would equal to it would be equal to 15 Super Walmart stores today in downtown Philadelphia. It's still open and operates as a Macy's. Uh, the department stores were the anchors to the downtown, and combined with civic uses, they brought people to the city center on a regular basis. These people then shopped at the small retailers. Unfortunately, the downtowns lost their anchors in the 1950s and 1960s for a number of reasons, primarily due to transportation and over-protectionism from other department stores who would convince city centers from allowing other stores to open. Cities uh, such as Bay City included five and dime stores or the equivalent of dollar stores today, and they had high amounts of traffic typically 30 to 40,000 cars per day would go through the main street. Uh, when I worked on the uh, an al alternative plans for the market center in the Kentlands, we had great debates about how much traffic should go through your main street. And I was a proponent for getting all of the residents that we could to drive through the main street to go past the shops rather than having them bypass the downtown. Uh, downtowns lost market share. They had about 80% of market share up until about 1960. Today, downtowns have about 2 or 3% of market share, and mostly downtowns sell things that we don't need. They sell things like scented candles and body sh 
can't body soaps and things like that that are nice to buy but if you want to go downtown and buy a pair of socks or buy a mattress or buy a car you just ca simply can't do that anymore that's not the exception we are the exception to the world most other city centers in the world still have the dominant market share Auckland New Zealand for example has about 70 percent of the market share you can buy everything you need in downtown Auckland American cities today have about two percent of the market share that's a huge that's been a sharp decline from its 70 percent in the 1970s most of our shopping occurs now in power centers about 37 percent or 31 percent in regional malls nine percent in the internet and seven percent in lifestyle centers and a, a consequence of this loss of market share is that there are many inner ring neighborhoods right now that are just frankly underserved with retail or their food deserts we're working in south memphis right now it's a federally uh, designated food desert and its only grocery store is shown in the lower left and it's only one of two restaurants is the wendy's in the upper right now prior to losing market share prior to having down the retail leave this neighborhood it was a sustainable neighborhood because it had lots of shops. Tony neighborhoods such as Southampton, where we're working right now, have been able to keep market share. They're full of retail, primarily because of heavy zoning. They just simply say, no, you cannot build retail outside of the downtown. About 40% of all retail in America today, like it or not, occurs in these power centers or what the industry calls community centers. About 30% of all shopping occurs in regional enclosed malls. And contrary to popular myth, the mall is not going to go away. About a 20 to 30% of the malls will go away and be turned into something else. But the remaining 60 to 70% of the malls we're forecasting will be around for a very long time. And malls tend to outperform downtowns by about 10 to 1 on a sales per square foot basis and they tend to overperform lifestyle centers or town centers by two to three to one. Uh, that's especially true with luxury malls right now. And we have a client that owns a fleet of luxury malls and they've just hired a staff right now just to break leases just so that they can bring in other tenants. There are more tenants that want to go into malls than there are space. The lifestyle or town center component that we've all come to love and which Kentlands was a very early pioneer on uh, only has about 7% of the market share. Um, and these went through a period in the 1990s and early 2000s where many of them collapsed because they didn't have department stores. In order for these to be sustainable, they have to have department stores. Uh, we work on what, what we call retrofitting or repositioning a number of these town centers. This one, for example, in Florida, uh, has never been more than about 50% occupied. It still has dirt floors for some of the spaces, even though it's a beautifully designed center. One of the reasons that town centers have not been competitive is that they don't have what I call the X factor. They, as beautiful as they can be designed, as close as we can get them, get them to look historic, they just don't have the John Crosses. They don't have the cool place that it, it takes generations to build. They don't have the cool signs. Uh, we're trying to emulate that. This is a group of pop-up stores that we're building in northern Michigan right now to try to create the X Factor, but I believe it takes generations to create this funky character that you know it when you see it, but it's really hard to describe. The new trend in retail is to build lifestyle or town centers in real city centers. This is Blueback Square in West Hartford, Connecticut where they actually build an entire new town center uh, dovetailed into a historic Main Street. This is great for the historic small shops because they get the power, the pulling power of major retailers like Crate and Barrel, and it's good for the Crate and Barrels because they get the power of the uh, local independent retailers. The national retailers are right now seeking city centers to go to. All of the growth is seen to be in downtowns. They're not building a lot of new malls. They're building about one mall per year right now. And this is part of the reason why. 80% of all Americans live in urbanized areas, and 50% of all US residents live in these blue counties. 
We are a, a region, uh, we are a country of city centers. About 50% of all Americans today prefer to live in walkable communities like the Kentlands. About 45% of Americans prefer to live in conventional suburbs. Now when the Kentlands was built, only about 20% of Americans preferred to live in walkable communities and it's been a significant change and I think it's going to continue growing. The large uh, format retailers, especially uh, Target and Walmart, are rediscovering cities and they have what they call urban stores. Walmart, has them across, uh, Walmart and Target have them across the country. This is a one in Washington, D.C., a Walmart in a Washington, D.C., in a historic building. We are at the very beginning of this where mainstream retailers, especially department stores, are building smaller scaled stores frequently in historic buildings in city centers because that's where the shoppers are, that's where the growth potential is. And I say that's a more sustainable model to provide the goods and services that people like, that people need and they desire in places where they live. There's been research that shows that when you have a high walk score that you can have retails on retail uh, rents an average seven dollars higher per square foot. And I think the best, one of the best models in the country is all, has been Charleston. Charleston's mayor, Joe Riley, who's been the mayor now for 40 years, has been on an effort to provide Charleston residents and visitors with the goods and services that they need and desire. He's uh, fathered the rebuilding of a very historic city. He's built it to a high standard. And Charleston, as a result, has a great collection of, of very unique, high-quality, independent retailers like Ben Silver and a great collection of regional and national chains like William Sonoma. They even have a dollar store. But these, built, these national stores are built in a historic building to a very high standard. They, of course, have the Charleston City Market. So I think, I say the future of retailing is going to be urban. The growth for both national, local, and regional retail will be in city centers. The retailers are finding very high sales here. Developers are finding very high rents in city centers. And uh, I think the vision that Kentland had 25 years ago, although at the time was very much way out there, is today mainstream. And had Kentland's been built today, there's no question that it would have been built per the original DPZ vision. You would have had uh, main streets, you would have had large format retailers built in a new urban model. You would have had more mixed use with housing and office above. And I say you were, ahead, you were ahead of your time and it's just a matter of time before I think you'll come back, we'll come back to that vision. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? I am uh, Colin Green, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about kind of three future things that I think uh, the potential for, uh, that, that, that have great potential here in, in Kentlands. I'd, I want to start out, I feel like Mike a little bit. Mike was talking about the past and wanted to talk about the future. By the way, do every single one of the things that Mike <laughs> described, and don't ask any more questions. Just <laughs> trust him. Um, those are all great ideas, they'll make the place better. So we were lucky enough uh, at, at my firm, HOK, to be involved with the city of Gaithersburg and many of you in the audience in the preparation of a plan uh, which we call successional planning. The way to take uh, Kentland's shopping centers, the three of them essentially, and talk about their framework for future growth. How can those be transformed uh, into what Bob was describing as uh, future uh, retail in an urban setting? Um, this was uh, Kentlands and Lakelands together. Uh, this is a DPZ uh, drawing showing the, the, the black squares in the upper left are, are the, uh, this is kind of a Noli diagram of where the buildings are and where the open space is and the, the parking lots uh, are what you see uh, in that plan. 
what was brilliant about the original plan for Kentlands was that it was really already prepared uh, to accept future growth in place without having to go to the next road over, the next development site. By the way, there aren't very many of those uh, in Gaithersburg anymore. Um, so it was really a plan for constant evolution. Many of you are familiar with this diagram. This is the transect, also created by Duane Plater Zyberg, which talks about how we can arrange all of our spaces that we occupy from a, a level of rural uh, to the left of the diagram to urban. And, and Kentlands has several of these different transect zones already in place. And the nice thing about transect planning is that you can, over time, move from one of these zones to the next by redeveloping, by building more density, by providing new opportunities like rail, like transit. Um, and so we began with, uh, we kind of had a cheat sheet. Mike actually showed one of the diagrams that uh, I'll, I'll backtrack for just a second. When I got hired, uh, I answered uh, one of Peter Katz's telephone calls. And I think Mike handed me the phone and said, you talk to him. No, I'm just, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, but Peter was doing his book. His book is actually, had actually come out and he said, I need a drawing. It was started by Charles Barrett, um, and the drawing was of the Kentlands Shopping Center. And it was probably the worst drawing that Charles ever drew because it was basically parking lots and, 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 and buildings on it. And he said, and, and Andres had talked to him for a long time about the plan after the revolution. And there was this drawing that needed to be done that was going to show how we could possibly accept this shopping center in this wonderful community of Kentlands but it's not the end state. Uh, and so I isolate just the Kentland Square side of the street for the moment because the wisdom of the original plan was that if you arrange the streets and the drive aisles to be streets later and build the parking lots to a size that can accommodate more development with structured parking, you're actually prepared for it already. You don't have to knock anything down, so to speak, in order to build up later. So, we started in uh, 2007 uh, on a plan that had a couple of uh, ideas involved. They basically took that plan and said, let's give it some, some uh, technical data. Let's talk about what those streets are going to be like. Let's talk about the capacity for each of these sites to be redeveloped. And let's uh, uh, deliver it to the city and to Kentlands as the plan for future growth. Uh, so how do we uh, convert this uh, suburban model to a town center, to something with more density? And remember that what generated this idea of this plan was the Corridor City Transitway alignment. The city of Gaithersburg essentially wanted to deliver a letter to the state that said that the planning done in the 60s and 70s about transit, which was going to deliver people to employment centers, taking them from home to work, and that was about it, should really be realigned so that it lands in town centers, Kentlands being one of them, Crown being another. Uh, so that the route from Shady Grove out uh, would be uh, connecting these places where people can use the rail for more than just one job. So we developed a, 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 a future plan. Uh, of course, we couldn't resist doing it in watercolor uh, because it's a future plan, right? So one thing should remain. We should always do watercolors for everything. Um, but this is the overlay of the future downtown Kentlands the name gets a few people riled up. Um, but uh, whatever we call it, uh, it was called the Kentlands, what was it called? The Kentlands Boulevard Commercial District Plan, which is very unsexy. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the plan that we delivered. It's, it's available, you can look at it. What we think is that people should familiarize themselves with it, and then in the next uh, time that uh, Kentlands business leaders get together, that the developers think about what to do, refer to that plan and see how it could actually uh, become a reality. This was a plan that was done as a special study area, not because there was a developer ready to build it, but as a way to deliver to the city a plan that is in place uh, and is acceptable for the next generation. Um, the images, uh, this is actually a view up uh, Market Street, uh, the uh, diner uh, on the left-hand side looking up toward uh, the uh, this traffic circle on Kentlands Boulevard, just to show that these are things that could become from one story to three and four uh, over time. Uh, someone asked me today about this image, which had a, a large green space uh, in it, and we believe very strongly that as we, 
as we densify, we need to remember that we need to deliver open and useful space to the community. So when we're developing at four to six times what is there now, uh, we don't want to develop every single space. We want to make sure that there still is public space uh, as part of the elements uh, of the plan. Uh, and protecting the streetscape and making Kentlands Boulevard more crossable were also uh, things that were identified in the plan. Um, you know, the, 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 the nice uh, thing about a plan like that is it, it, it tends to give you a couple of uh, kind of sound bites to move forward with, right? So if there's something that I would tell you to do uh, in preparation for doing this, it's support transit. That's easy. We're all planners. We say this all the time, support transit. I've seen reports that, you know, the new alignment is actually damaging because it's so circuitous that people would never give up the opportunity to take their car to Shady Grove because it would take exactly the same amount of time or longer to hop on the train. But I remember going back a ways, we also used to argue for new urbanism in saying that costs on the individual are higher when you have to own multiple cars. The time that you spend on a uh, public transit uh, system rather than driving and fighting for ground space with the other cars are things to think about. So it's not a linear discussion. I think this is something that we really have to do. We realigned uh, uh, with the help of the city, uh, the CCT, uh, so that it does come to the side with the density and the mixed uses. It promotes the strategy that the city has of placing those things in there. They're, they're making investments in these town centers. And so let's make sure that the rail is a benefit, uh, rail or bus, uh, it doesn't matter really, uh, that those things be uh, connected. Um, this is sort of the current state. The picture on the left is the metro map. We're all familiar with it, the red line, blue line, green line, even the silver line shows up in this diagram off to the left. Um, and really, I don't know if anyone has seen this, this if you follow the, the Greater Greater Washington blog, this is where I first saw it. But this is the map that connects Baltimore to Washington, D.C., includes the CCT, the Purple Line, all of those kinds of initiatives that are out there, and all of a sudden, we're Paris or we're London because we're better connected, we have these opportunities. This is the future potential of our region because Kentlands has a big story to tell, not just inside its boundaries, but for the whole part of greater Washington. You know, this is really a model for how a suburban location can become something that's better connected to the fabric of two of the most important East Coast cities. You know, I only say two of the most because Washington's the most and then there's Baltimore, which is great. Um, I love Baltimore. Um, and then th the next thing I really wanted to mention is I wanna continue to encourage, I don't know that you need this much encouragement really, uh, or that I'm giving you any, but this is, Gaithersburg has always been a place that has welcomed the public dialogue that you are encouraged to speak for your full three minutes uh, at, 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 at public hearings. And uh, I think, Dick, you've memorized how long three minutes is, right? You <laughs> wrap it up right at three. <laughs> but this is a place to continue to help evolve Kentlands. Gaithersburg is probably the best city where Kentlands could have landed uh, because it's always been a system of understanding what a charrette is, understanding how to use the information to make great decisions, and also being patient. You know, this is the 25th anniversary of Kentlands, and the fact that we're the same faces, having the same discussion, and we're not really just saying congratulations, we're saying, what's next? What's, what are we gonna do at the, 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 the K-50 celebration? And so I just want to leave everybody with, a, with, with, with the understanding that I believe that one thing is important about the future of Kentlands, and that is that it's also very human. So I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to uh, people who have worked on this project tirelessly. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Mike. Uh, he was really my mentor uh, going through this process. And there is no future of these kinds of projects that's just sort of solely digitized. You don't put a piece of paper in a machine and it pops out the other end and you have a town. It requires the human touch. And I think the fact that all of us are sitting here today and celebrating this and asking questions about what's next is a testament to that. So I wanna thank everyone for helping me start my career and also inviting me back uh, to talk about the rest of Kentland's history because I think we can do that together. Thank you. Hi, um, 
I'm John Torty. I'm gonna try to knit some things that we've seen uh, throughout the day. And there we go. Uh, and uh, talk about uh, one very special memory that I have uh, regarding Kentlands. And that was the day I fell in love with Liz Plater Zyber. <laughs> but you're going to have to wait just a little bit for that part of the story. I have a few more things I want to say. Don't, don't go back because I, I have to send that to Andres. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, watch out. I will not live past midnight. Okay. Uh, to go back to something that Alex talked about earlier, uh, this is a quote that I've been dying to find out who uh, wrote or said, but people choose to live in cities so that they can help each other grow to their maximum potential. When I first saw this quote, I said, huh, I thought cities were all about bricks and mortar and how great uh, we designers can make them. But this makes a whole lot of sense, that we come together from the forest, from the fields, so that we could all help each other get as good as we could possibly be. So in that regard, I would like to spend a, two seconds thanking Liz and Andres for their mentorship through the last 20 years of my career. It's meant an unbelievable amount to me and my firm. Uh, I'd like to thank Gaithersburg for being so welcoming a place that Kentlands can actually happen and, and get built. Michael, you know, you are the shepherd of this place. And Marina, you are the new shepherdess of this place. Take care of it. Uh, and and I, I actually think uh, Chevy Chase Bank deserves a shout out for what it did as, in a very, very, very difficult time. So uh, thank you all. But um, what I want to run through quickly here is a couple of thoughts about why this place is so good. This is a traditional town. 25 years ago, the new urbanism was called traditional neighborhood design. And traditional neighborhoods and traditional architecture are such because they are, make buildings and places where human beings feel comfortable. And the events of the last two days have definitely proven that this is a place that is about people. The, the, the set or the setting that uh, DPZ created for Cantlands is truly remarkable. It wrestles the automobile back to its place of subservience and it promotes the place for human beings to be. The notion of uh, the public realm or simply the spaces in between the buildings being more important than the buildings themselves is very, very clear here. The notion of connectivity, of connecting neighborhoods to neighbor, neighborhoods and blocks to blocks, buildings to buildings, and neighbors to neighbors is very, very uh, in, in, important here. And the notion of mix, of mixing everything, not only mixing uses, but mixing people, mixing building types, mixing uh, ages, mi mixing income groups, all of what really makes great great communities. This is Michael waiting for a table. Uh, uh, so the, the, the idea of uh, how this place evolved is really an idea of a great set of ideas in the beginning. Joe's comments on the flute tape were very poignant last night. That He wanted to make a place about people and that's exactly what has been made. And how about this, 25 years ago, this young couple. <laughs> so not long after 25 years ago uh, comes my moment of epiphany with uh, Liz. It was at the first CNU Congress in Alexandria, Virginia, where she got up, and this is a relatively uh, uh, 
a picture relatively about the same time. This is 93, 90, 93. And Liz got up and did a presentation about the difficulties that she was having with the retail downtown plan of Cantlands. And here I am, a young acolyte in the uh, religion of new urbanism, and I'm saying, oh, one of my heroes is talking about a failure. And then I said, well, wow, this is pretty gutsy. This is brave. What a woman. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I never forget that moment, Liz. I never, never will. You know, for those of you who are not in the design business, Liz and Andreas have been the most unselfish professionals I have ever, ever, ever come in contact with. Take a picture of Alex, everybody. <laughs> so, you know, she, she gets up and she talks about the original plan, which is the quintessential American Main Street. And we're all like, so sad, it never got built. I'm here to tell you I'm so happy it didn't get built because the future is brighter. And the notion of, you know, Aldo Rossi's plan and the, and then the block plan that, uh, uh, that Colin talk, talks about and, and uh, Michael talked about, all, you know, genius in the end of trying to make something out of, out of nothing. It's a hard, hard piece. So this is what's, what, what is there now. So the essence of my talk here is how do a group of people that have come together to make a remarkable community deal with the future? I've heard last night, you know, we're going to change over my dead body. I love this place. <laughs> Sounded like a bunch of nimnies. Uh, I've heard we're going to go to the future. So all I'm suggesting is that when you look at the future, the argument of sustainability is a very, very important argument. Somewhere in the 80s, we surpassed the capacity of our globe to support us at the rate that we in uh, highly industrialized countries like to live. We in this country are almost double the global average in, uh, in carbon emissions. We in this country can get better at almost every density level that we live at, uh, in, whether we're urbanists or middle urbanists or suburbanists, if in fact we make adjustments. And the adjustments essentially say, get out of the damn car. It and walk to work, walk home, take transit. Th those are the biggest, biggest, biggest moves. Uh, a new urbanist colleague and co-founder of the CNU, Peter Calthorpe, you know, puts it in, uh, in, in some simple terms, you know, match the density to the maximum capacity of the transit system, and then develop centers where jobs and uh, housing have a one-to-one -one ratio. For every job available, there's a place to live for that person in a, in a walking distance. This is not so difficult to do. Yet, Cantlands, as wonderful as it is, was very difficult to do. It's not easy with the world operating at a, an, in a different way. Your future transit, Colin just showed a more complicated version of this, but this shows Kentlands on the line, uh, and it is a coming, will be a great impetus for change here. Somebody talked about Leo Creer earlier today. He talks about the three pieces of, of a city. I have my own version here uh, showing pictures from Kentlands. Uh, the, the, the civic parts of the city are not going to change. Nobody's taking down the big house on the hill. The private parts of the city, the homes, are not going to change. That is America. But the commercial part of the city is going to change. It's a question of how the citizens, the city, and the developers 
create a dialogue to allow this change to occur. This is Colin's plan, his drawing he just showed you uh, about a view of this. In my mind, this is such a, uh, a great opportunity to make Cantlands a totally sustainable place, to give the young kids a downtown that the X factor may happen. Uh, maybe it doesn't take, everything is compressing. Bob, it doesn't take six generations. Maybe we could do it in one generation or a half a generation. But to complete the city, these are sketches from Michael Morrissey, Charles Barrett's successor, uh, about just some other kinds of places that one might find Kentlands downtown to be. But in the end, this is an issue for the citizens of Kentlands to deal with. This is a, one of my very favorite quotes from Plato. The city is what it is because its citizens are what they are. So continue the good work, citizens of Kentlands, and enjoy the future. You have a bright one ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, thank you guys. I was going to, I, I had a question for them, but they sort of answered it. I was going to ask them, where do you see Cantons going in the next 10 years? But they've, um, I'm going to open it up to questions instead because they began to address that um, actually quite effectively. Dick. Do I have to repeat that? <laughs> Let me paraphrase. The, um, uh, Dick was saying that the HOK study is available on a website. Uh, maybe it would be a good idea for, for it to get onto the Kenan's website. Uh, can you remind me what the website is? It's the city's website. City's website, okay. Yeah, just Google on uh, Kenan's Commercial District Special Study Area Kentland Special yeah. District. Okay, got it. And then he mentioned uh, Joe Allen in the back, who um, is, I guess, is an advocate for the uh, for the for the transit coming through this through um, downtown. Are there any other questions for our panel? I guess
guess everybody's ready for happy hour. Yeah. <laughs> Eileen, do you want to come up and wrap it up? Thank you. One question. Please. Oh, sorry. There we have it. Sorry, there seemed to be one question. Well, it's I, the more interesting streetscape, and I, I, I like it a lot better, even though I don't go there for that much, but I think visually it's much more exciting. So are you all familiar with the Rio? She was talking yeah. about why, um, why we just the successes of Rio. But Rio doesn't have residential. I mean, um, it has it on the periphery. Well, I, I, I thought Rio uh, it was interesting because of where it started with the, the buildings around the lake and the movie theater. And they came and added to that, so it's much better than that. But I, it's, it, the reason I don't put it in the same frame of mind with mm -hmm. Kentlands because I think what you're going to get is a whole lot more than, than that. I think Rio is okay. It's got parking. It's got streets. It's got good shops. But that's all it has. Yeah. It, it really, the, you have to walk a block or two before you get to the first apartment. It doesn't have that kind of integrated feeling of community in my eye. And, and, and so this is why I implore the Ketlinites to uh, really become part of that planning process of what is bound to happen here so that the, it could be a continuum of Ketlins and not something separate. But the, that, I agree with that, what everything said about the real or Washingtonian. But in its day, it was a tremendous breakthrough to go with the two-story Target and two-story Coles and the, the Galleons and to do what they did. It was a huge breakthrough. Can it's I tell the real story? <laughs> yeah, no, I just thought of this. With, this is pre-Kentlands, when, uh, when the movie theater was there with one Italian restaurant down by the lake. What was, ob what was weird about it, which was weird and wonderful about that, both at the same time, is it was the first place you may call a place in the burbs. And people flocked to it. Yeah. And it was a lake, a movie theater, and a pizza place. And it, was, it became a very popular center for this region. Because it was, so people were so starved for this kind of thing. And then Kenlin's came. You know, one of the other things to keep in mind about the whole Washingtonian development was it came online at a time when the rules about retail had everything to do with the visibility and the traffic count. And you can't get many more cars than sort of 370 and uh, 270 intersection. And so in looking at sites in that day and time, it was, that was the superior location for a bunch of reasons. And, and those rules are all gone now. As, Start time. as well as you can plan it, uh, it can be built and implemented. Yep. By the way, I'm still borrowing from the Kentlands. I just did a little sketch last week where we borrowed from the way the corner was handled with a beveled corner, the opening in the street going through. I just copied that last week for a little <laughs> center of doing in Traverse City, Michigan. Right. It's still still ahead of its time. We want to fill that one in. <laughs> Yes. There's some more to that story too. The company that developed Rio hired a developer from Baby and then went to the city, took all of the ideas that had been developed of what happened with the Kevin's, the two Kevin's shopping centers, and applied them to Rio because the city made them do it. So it was the influence of Kevin's that created. Very nice kind of town center that doesn't have a town around. And it's unlikely that we'll get the town around it. More likely that we will get a city center from this town. I would like to say that the retail is in the city, the city and the residential around it is in the county. Right, it was. 
You know, Bob brought up something really, really important. The nature of retail, the nature of American Main Street retail has changed 360 or 180 degrees. That's more better? Yeah, okay. 180 degrees <laughs> since the beginning, since, since 25 years ago. I mean, it was it, that uh, the retail has, Main Street retail has seen a sea change where retailers would not talk to you about doing foolish ideas like walkable retail Main Street. Now they're all clamoring for it. And this is the guru, right? <laughs> Sitting right over here. The, uh, the challenging part we're finding now is that many cities are saying, we don't want you. We don't, I just had a city reject a Crate and Barrel and you know, all the flagship stores that wanted to go into the city because they said we would rather you go out and build a mall outside of the city. We don't want any national chains in our downtown. And I don't think in the long run that's a sustainable model where your residents have to drive to a mall to do their shopping, but live in the city. I think you need to be able to do both in yeah. the yeah. town center. Send them yeah. to Westport, Connecticut. They did the opposite. Yeah. I think Nanette had a question or comment. Um, yeah. oh, let me answer the second question uh, <laughs> first, because that's easier. Uh, we're not. No. Uh, many of you may know, we, we ran a little general store. and I say we. I showed up. Marilyn ran the whole thing, her, her baby. Um, it wasn't the right place. You know, it was a little corner store. There wasn't enough traffic to support it. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, uh, I would wish someone great luck to try it out again. But I think, you know, what, what may happen because of the the, the, the redensification is that maybe that kind of an entity could work on one of these smaller streets within the downtown. It would be a great location and you could still walk to it. Um, I don't remember specifically uh, on that. We, we uh, believe me, if there was a connection to be made from sites within uh, the downtown out, we could probably show it up here and, and point it out. Um, but you're talking about from the Colonnade Apartments down behind to, to sort of connect it to the giant. Yeah. Yeah, we have to go back to Colin's presentation. By the way, I think your live your Main Street, your live work Main Street is amongst the best in the country. Uh, it's probably the most successful main live work uh, grouping I've seen anywhere in the country. I'm sure there's others, mm -hmm. but it's the, it's the best and I can it, think of. And it has all of that parking from the parking lots from the, the supermarket right are, are behind them. Yeah, and they, don't, and they don't care. It's a nice coincidence. <laughs> yeah. Are there other questions, Jennifer? Yeah, see Mike. That's my. Listen to Mike more. <laughs> um, that's a really, really good question. Um, I'm probably going to answer with whatever is going to end up being my fifth best answer. If I just shout something out now, but you know, I think it, it was very interesting on our walk today about all of the things that you re-see, you know, five, ten years, twenty-five years later, that. Uh, have become part of what I've heard Andreas talk about many times is sort of the story rather than the history. So uh, small decisions, maybe things like, you know, the independent living building, right? We have all, we had all of these drawings of how that could have been retail on the ground floor or just done so much better, but we didn't really have, you know, we were artists, right? So we could draw a better solution, but we weren't putting up the money for it. Uh, we were trying to encourage them to do the right thing. I would say that perhaps 
Um, maybe one of the one of the decisions that we might have made a little bit differently was in uh, sort of the way that we that we balanced the backs of the live works with the rest of the parking lots in. I don't know that I have a better solution for it, except that we have to wait for it to happen. Uh, there is actually a little bit of a conflict between that parking behind those, and, and we've talked a big part of the charrette for uh, the master plan was in talking about how we can solve some of those problems, because they're, they don't work very fluidly. But I'm happy to report that that problem is something that's back of house. <laughs> So all of the fronts look great. I, I don't know that there's a lot I would change because I think there's just so much story to it. It's it's why I got into planning. You know, the, it didn't fail. Well, I'll give you one example to tie into your story very quickly. Um, when you And it, it ties into the idea of densifying the town center because we had the vision of what it was going to be. But if you're driving by Michaels, for all of you who know it, you're on a street and all of a sudden you find yourself in a parking lot. And so that's a, that's a no-no in the design world and in our in the way we work and so we can imagine how that would fill out and fill in and become a proper street that's certainly one that i think about the, the other point to add on the, the senior building is you couldn't get it to be mixed use you know it's a little bit like retail mainstream retail is now more fashionable than it was when that building was built well financing mixed use buildings is a whole lot better now than it was when that building was built. There was, you know, banks wouldn't, not even Jeff's bank would look at it. So I, uh, I tried to advocate for Kentlands Boulevard to actually be a main commercial street. And that was really out of the box thinking, but it would have been like an authentic downtown. And I think one of the main differences between a lifestyle center, a lifestyle downtown, and a real downtown is that the lifestyle streets are really fake streets. They don't go anywhere. And uh, if you had made Kentlands Boulevard or if you ever turn it into a real street with 25,000 cars per day, the retail will take care of itself. You'll have really high quality businesses there. You'd have to calm the traffic down. You'd have to have on-street parking. But it would be like a real city. I think the next, next question is going to have to be over drinks. <laughs> Otherwise, we could keep going. We've got a fascinating panel. Thank you.